Hello, fellow dudes, duderinos, and dudettes, and welcome to Uncultured Universe, the podcast where two friends show each other movies, TV, music, anything we damn well please to get each other a little more cultured. I am your host, Justin, and with me in the uncultured hot seat is the undeniable epitome of cool and slacker awesomeness, Joe. Ooh, my my buttons are sweating in this hot seat. <laughs> it is quite hot. It is it's unseasonably warm but cold at the same time. It's springtime. That's how we do it. Today we're going to be looking at the psychedelic cult classic The Big Lebowski from 1998. Now, this is my pick. Joe had never seen this before. So, Joe off the cuff, give me some hot takes of God. Big Lebowski. The spirit of 90s like chill wave just flows through me after watching this um big speak lebowski on speak on that <laughs> i would say a cult film fair to say yeah oh, yeah um we all used to the two of us plus uh another group of guys used to work together um and this was a quoted movie in a way that i didn't even know it was being quoted because i had never seen it but for some reason the the phrase and this guy peed on it was like <laughs> huge with our huge. group and i just i never fully got it but it was just funny so i kind of went along with it kind of tells you something about my personality anytime you um, mention yeah piss around joe he just finds it <laughs> hilarious <laughs> you're absolutely right there is that really fun connection there um so yeah uh, it mentioned in episodes past joe and i used to work together uh at a little startup called supply.com and we we built something great there didn't we we sure did uh we were on the ux team and our little little core group of like five six sometimes eight maybe at some, at the at the biggest point came and um, went, fluctuated seasons seasons um yeah this movie was was a beloved classic amongst us all uh except for joe who kind of just went along with the joke um just just having a good time um i i thought i could have sworn you saw it with this one time uh when I, we did a hot night and yeah. i'll explain what that is in a second but i thought you were there but you weren't it was on in the background during what might have been a poker night um or uh like a, a crunch time hot night but i don't know if i was fully paying attention to it yeah that's that's i think you're right uh the the hot night uh <laughs> that we're speaking of is a thing that we used to do back in the days of hustle you know, uh, back when people gave a damn about where they worked at, um, and we were young, we didn't know any better, honestly, pre pandemic, <laughs> the was, world was different. It was very different kids. Um, we stayed after for a couple hours to like bang out projects together or whatever. We ordered pizza and we threw up, uh, the big Lebowski on the, on the big screen in the room. And, uh, uh, everyone was just like riffing off quotes here and there. And Joe's just sitting there with a big smile on his face, I guess. Yeah, because um, you couldn't really you couldn't devote the time to it. Um, but I'm glad you were able to sit down with it now, like six years later. <laughs> yeah, it's a vibes movie. I've always known like roughly what it was about. And I've always been a fan of the Coen's movies. I think the late 90s, early 2000s Coen's movie that really hit for me was obviously Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yes. Like that. I mean, I'm I am from the North Georgia mountains that that soundtrack was huge for about five years up there. Like you could not sure. escape it. Um, mm -hmm. And so that movie was kind of the big Cohen's movie. And I guess also Deacon's movie. Um, if we're if we're talking Deke here. Yes, we, um, we are talking uh, big Deke energy over here. <laughs> uh, um, we're wrapping up March and our March series uh, collection of, 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 of episodes, which is really just two. So can you really call it a series? Can you call it a mini series? But sure you can. It's two. Uh, we're, Earring. you know, limited we're, edition. Yes. Okay. We'll do that. Um, our limited edition episodes uh, for March uh, have been looking at the cinematographer, uh, uh, patriarch. You know, the the badass of badasses, uh, Roger Deakins. And we started the month with Joe's pick, uh, nineteen seventeen, which could not be any more different. I was going to say like. <laughs> Boy, did we pick a spectrum here. <laughs> Heavy on the spectrum on the left and the right side of beautiful, uh, you know, um, heady war topics, graphic, you know, and then to like this weird stoner mystery crime mm. scene uh, or just crime syndicate sort of uh, stoner movie. 
and they're so vastly different. But we'll we'll t- we'll get into the 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 technical aspects of it. Uh, yeah, I have, I have my notes that's just called Deacons. So I've I've got some points. A, a whole a whole Deke section. Um, can't wait to dig into the deke there. Um, but first, yeah, before we go any further, let's let's just uh, look at a quick little trailer here, just to get, just to capture the vibes. Here we go. movie is a fever dream <laughs> justin <laughs> did so you funny. create a lo-fi version of what is it credence clearwater revival absolutely <laughs> i did that's incredible i tried okay so just real quick tangent i was gonna do like the acoustic guitar and the slide guitar and the drum and i was gonna do the whole thing perfect. and i was like perfect can't do it but no. let we, the laziness flow through you this episode and and I think it, in modern times the dude would love fucking lo-fi <laughs> tracks and and playlists. Like I've been super into to lo-fi like Zelda and Disney stuff, and that's what we play around the house uh, a lot of the time throughout the day. Um, so it just struck my brain. I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna make a lo-fi "Looking Out My Back Door" by CCR, and it I- rolls. I have like such a clear analog to the who the dude is in modern times these days, like just in pop culture that I am so excited to talk about because like there's there's some ways that they are so alike and some ways that they are so different. But I'll we'll get into it. Great. I have a couple guesses, but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah. So uh, this movie directed by Joel Cohen, written by the Cohen brothers, Joel and Ethan, um, of course, cinematography by Sir Roger Deakins. Mm-hmm. Uh, released March 6th, 1998. Joe, you were but four. I was four, yeah. A bay before. Uh, Saw so, theaters eight times. <laughs> you couldn't stop. <laughs> yeah, you're spending your <laughs> allowance left and right. Uh, starring Jeff Bridges, John Goodman, Julianne Moore, Steve Buscemi, David Huddleston, and John Turturro. Um, a budget of $15 million dollars. And uh, they recouped about three times that at the box office, uh, forty-seven point four million. Uh, and that kind of goes back to the point you were saying of cult status and how that kind of flies in the face of it. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. A um, couple little little fun facts here: uh, Robert Duvall, Anthony Hopkins, Sir Anthony Hopkins, uh, Gene Hackman, John Nicholson, and Tommy Lee Jones were all considered for the role of the Big Lebowski. Oh, I was going to say like the Jeff Bridges role, like no way. No, 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 no. The big, no, that makes, role. that makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they're all older gentlemen. Uh, but, uh, uh, a couple things like Anthony Hopkins namely turned it down. Cause he's like, I don't want to play an American. Get out of here. <laughs> Throw the script out the window. I don't want, that. I don't want to go on a plane. <laughs> yeah. Um, Charlize Theron was, uh, considered for the bunny Lebowski role before it was okay. even a Tara Reed, um, dynamite side character for, yeah, all of thirty seconds that she she's pretty up. great in one scene. Yeah, <laughs> hilarious. Uh, and then, uh, lest we forget, uh, our dearly departed Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, was uh, in this flick as well. So he's so good. He's at playing those adored. characters. Such a cringy nerd, but uh, is so great. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, let's 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 just go ahead and just uh uh you know, laid the groundwork here. What did, what did you think? What did you know going into this and what were your expectations? And then what did you ultimately take away from it? I, rolling credits. I, I think of this as a cult film. I had always known about the big Lebowski. And in my mind, it was kind of like, like a Seinfeld type thing where it's famously just like about nothing. And it's about just like, not necessarily like the stoner culture of uh, the 90s, but like maybe like a um, 
the identity crisis of the 90s, right? So sure. I, I, I knew it was kind of like about this, like kind of in between period and these people kind of caught in this period. Yeah. And it's 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 a comedy. It's a Coen's film. So there's naturally going to be like some uh, befuddled criminals uh, in the mix. There's there's going to be criminal hijinks oh, yeah. uh, that ultimately don't really lead anywhere. Um, yeah, this movie is incredibly hijinky. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I knew that vibe. I didn't realize like how many like moments in the film that I would just genuinely laugh out loud. Like I wasn't expecting there's a scene where uh, Jeff Bridges Lebowski is listening to the porn producer taking notes on a phone call. Mm -hmm. And then the porn producer like goes out of the room and he goes over to like figure out what he was writing on his notepad and he scratches over it to trace it. And it's just like a picture of a dude with an erection. <laughs> And he's just like staring at it like, what <laughs> the hell? And then he hears him coming and he like runs back and he just like. <clears throat> Very cool. Hilarious. Scene. Love that. Um, it's yeah, I, I found it to be like a, a f funny, endearing kind of almost like a clash of classes in a way. Like there's there's zaniness in like the weird, like lower class. Uh, slacker area that they are in with this like this bowling team who are just obsessed with bowling and their own little world yeah and they just like want to do that in vietnam <laughs> um, and then they they get caught up in these these um machinations of these like uber rich people who are also like equally zany and ultimately like have stupid pointless lives yeah. uh, um and so they <laughs> there's a lot of uh showing the differences between classes there but also the same in terms of like it's the 90s none of this makes sense i mean it it still plays true uh aside from like some of the technology standpoints like you could you could make this movie show this movie today and it would still hit because there's mm -hmm. still uh, a lot of those like you said like the class things and just like uh structure versus unstructure you know slacker versus you know like traditional or whatever of like hardworking people and um just like upending all of that kind of stuff of just being this weird meandering story um which yeah I'm I I am very curious to see how you do with uh trying to succinctly in one minute to give a a plot description because this movie is so fucking all over the place yeah, I, I'm just going to have to do high level. <laughs> Maybe I'll start at the start, skip to the end, and then just kind of try to meet in between. I don't know. Um, that's, not a, that's honestly, you know what? Not a bad strategy. Okay. Since we're in there, since we're already like in the room with it, let's just do it. Fuck it. I'll try it. Joe, yeah. I'm going to give you a minute. Give me your best uh, uh, succinct uh, reclamation of uh, The Big Lebowski. Uh, three, two, one, start. All right, so Jeff Bridges plays Jeffrey Lebowski. He's kind of like a stoner slacker in California, right? Um, his best friends are John Goodman and Steve Buscemi. They're on this like bowling team, and they just kind of like philosophically slack off and talk about bowling. Jeff Bridges kind of gets involved in this conspiracy with this like rich guy's missing wife uh, because the rich guy has the same name as him. And so the people who supposedly kidnapped his wife attack bridges um and so the rich guy ultimately hires bridges to figure out like the money swap to get his wife back but then it keeps on spiraling out of control there's more people who are introduced the rich guy's daughter played by julianne moore comes into play uh and like sleeps with bridges to get pregnant um and it ultimately comes down to sam elliott kind of like laying things straight as the narrator and uh bridges goodman and buscemi get into a fight with some nihilists buscemi dies and bridges and goodman kind of just end up back where they were that's you know what it's I think I hit some stuff there. You hit it there. Like all the whole movie takes the over the course of like a few days, right? I got to the nihilist way too late. <laughs> the fucking nihilist. There's it's, like 3 seconds left. It's such a fun like seven layer dip of a movie that things just keep getting introduced cuz like the 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 beginning kind of idea of the plot uh, plot of like mistaken identity and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, this is kind of what that's going to be. I can kind of see. But Which, then they keep throwing things left and right. I, I did like that it was all... It's it's very much just like a uh, an exercise in like bigger and bigger dominoes. Because it all starts with like, oh, one of the... One of the thugs pees on his rug. Uh, and so that leads to him going to the rich Lebowski, the big Lebowski titular. 
um, and asking for money for the rug. The Big Lebowski then um, ends up like hiring him as kind of like a nobody to figure out this like money drop off. The money drop off leads to um, John Goodman's character coming in with crazy conspiracy theories and plans for like stealing the money on their own. Like John Goodman in this, like it's I'm sure it's been said a million times before. This man does not have an Oscar nomination to his name. He should have an award for this. He fucking like, should. He is so incredibly good in this. And he's psychotic and like dangerous, but also endearing. And I just want to watch him the entire yeah. time. John Goodman is the embodiment of like loose cannon character mm -hmm. throughout. Mm -hmm. Like you never know when he's going to fly off the handle, when he's going to bring up Vietnam or when he's going to like do something incredibly violent or uh and then just like immediately wheel it back around and just be like oh i'm sorry dude yeah <laughs> someone someone we all know who's just like obsessed with three things to a degree that's like worrying mm -hmm. and has like <laughs> incredible mood swings um and has like the confidence of someone who can pull things off when he he never really can but he can also this this movie is so much about people talking themselves out of situations that they've landed in mm -hmm. um and just like through sheer vocabulary um convincing people to do things or to take their side on things yeah this movie waxes poetic a little bit um <laughs> but it but like you said like it's on a very low barrier to entry slacker level of just be like no dude that guy fucking pissed on your rug you need to go <laughs> get your fucking money back shut the fuck up johnny and just go back to it and it's it's so lived in uh and i think part of that is you know uh uh case in part due to uh, uh roger deacon's input as cinematographer mm -hmm. the the warmth atmospheres that you get from like the um the home settings the the neon brownness yellows that you get from the bowling alley uh everything just... kind of looks like a porn studio like that's kind of like the vibe of it so when the porn <laughs> angle throws in you're just like oh yeah this, this totally fits <laughs> fucking log jamming is my favorite name for a fake porno <laughs> ever <laughs> yeah i mean my notes on the deacons of it all like obviously we we did this miniseries so out of order in an insane way. We we start with 1917, which is a movie he did in 2019, was it? 2019? Um, and so that is obviously like a front and foremost cinematography spectacle, right? Yes. Like that's, yes. that is the big hook with that movie is how did they do this with this camera? Um, and so you got a lot of talk. You got a lot to talk about with Deacons in that movie. We backtrack to... Um, Big Lebowski and not only do you kind of like start to feel them like not laying the bones but like solidifying the bones of like what a Cohen's like wacky crime caper drama comedy yeah. is like mm -hmm. there's like a dusty feel to it um, there's very much like orange and brown undertones mm -hmm. um, but you also it's 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 a harder movie to talk about in terms of like the impact of the cinematography on it but what i came down to is like this is such a movie that is like almost exclusively like conversations between like multiple zany characters just like taking stock of what is currently happening figure out what the next move is and just mm -hmm. like dealing with each other in sometimes like close quarters yeah um and so i think the cinematography in there you don't notice it as much but i think there's like an art to it being so seamless in the way that you don't notice it like i bet it, if you if you or i tried to like shoot a conversation scene like we'd fuck it up immediately you know oh yeah there's there's balance all throughout um there's there's really neat uses of uh like vanishing perspectives uh mm -hmm. that that deacons does really well and you get that pretty easily in a bowling alley when mm -hmm. you have like rows of uh fluorescent lights or you have rows of the alleys themselves that like kind of create this vanishing point. It's really yeah. neat. It's really neat the way, the way that he was able to use the space to elevate it a lot. And, and, and that's the thing that I keep coming back to uh, when I think of this movie from a Deacon's perspective, which I forgot to turn on in my brain, like 30 minutes in Ryan was like, and what's the point of this movie again? Like the guy who does the camera. And I was like, Oh fuck, you're right. I've been watching this movie for 30 minutes, just like laughing my ass off, having a good time. It's like, Oh yeah, shit. 
I had like uh, one note on Tekins as I was watching. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we'll fill this in. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and you know what? And that is, that is the exact attitude that the dude would hundred percent abide by. It's Which just I like, I wasn't worried about any of this. Yeah. It's not even a big deal. You know, uh, I put in so little effort to this episode. Um, <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, but yeah, so Roger Deakins elevated this movie to feel so welcoming and comforting. And I mm-hmm. think that's, that is what lends itself to this movie being a cult classic. Cause even though it, it didn't follow the traditional trajectory of, you know, like having a modest budget and like utterly failing at the box office and then like s- several years in between. And then it kind of finds its steam on home video. This didn't have that. Like it did pretty well in theaters and had modest sales and, you know, considerably grow or grew from there. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with just like how the film feels lived in. And I think part of that is the dialogue that you already talked about. It's conversation-y. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, it's the look of it. It is warm. It's lived in. It's very 90s. It's very, but like with the backdrop of like 70s music, which is straight from, you know, the dude's tape deck, that kind of stuff. But I ultimately have a hypothesis as to why this movie is considered a cult classic. Mm-hmm. And I think it is due in part to those two things I already mentioned, but like the stoner chill vibe of it all, um, as well as like the disjointed pulp fictiony, pulp fiction esque kind of storyline. It's like it's crime and compounding uh, like consequences and stuff. And I think that really resonated with the right crowd at the time, which was college kids. Mm-hmm. Um. College kids love nothing more than to fucking slap, slack off, uh, drink, and smoke weed. And <laughs> there's a lot to admire in the in the main character of the dude from 18 to 23 year olds of just being like, just let it slide off, and um, it's all good, you know. So that it's, is my that's my hypothesis there. Yeah, no, I I, I completely agree. I I think the dude fits in perfectly in the 90s for this to be like a comedy and for him to be relatable like because that kind of i mean fits the vibe of like a specific uh type of like slacker film that was popular then the the analog that i had for him uh in movies and tv today uh have you ever seen shameless i did watch like part of the first season but yes yes william h macy plays frank gallagher in shameless who's like the patriarch of the family and it's it's a similar situation where like he will do anything to avoid work um and then he slacks off but then like has the the vocabulary and kind of the intelligence to like talk people into like why what he's doing is actually justified and how like he's he's maybe the victim here or he's like the hero here and uh i i'm not sure it works as well as a comedy here because shameless goes to like some very dark places um with him maybe because it is more like in modern times and it's not like oh you know the free and easy 90s uh when this was set <laughs> the free uh, and easy 90s <laughs> like we all remember it yeah 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 and like we're i'm i'm speaking of the 90s as if i wasn't alive for half of it but like yeah um i i i had a, one more note about cinematography though like mm. i I'm, I'm glad you brought up pulp fiction because i'm realizing now like that is the clear uh connection to an episode that we've done in the past like this movie feels very much like a spiritual successor to pulp fiction it really obviously does. it's got some more like chill comedic uh vibes to it rather than like <laughs> high intensity and violence um but it is very episodic you're you're dealing with multiple characters kind of spiraling out fractaling out um but then from like a a look perspective i think lebowski has like these kind of crazier and crazier scenes of like them getting deeper and deeper unwittingly into these like crime proceedings but then you always kind of come back to the bowling alley every like 15 minutes or so. They just, they just yeah, kind of like, it's come kind of like you hit a peak there with the bowling alley and then you go back in. And so 
the the color palette does kind of change you get these kind of like warmer colors they're all kind of like seated they're just kind of it's it's almost like it's the end of the day let's let's talk through what happened mm -hmm. um and it's under the guise of like they have to go practice with their bowling team and pre prepare for this uh tournament um but you also don't get as much of like these like action scenes in the bowling alley it's kind of like a a little oasis uh, of its own within this story yeah. as it is in their lives i'm sure other than like uh john goodman's character pulling a gun on someone um <laughs> but then the 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 cool parts in the bowling alley from a cinematography perspective is also uh, a character we haven't really discussed yet which is sam elliott who's kind of like a greek chorus narrator <laughs> person and i i i don't know if this is like fully true but i i like what um the camera does with him because whenever it shows his character at least from what i was noting it's always like it shows something happening with like the dude and walter and um buscemi uh what is, what is his name shut the fuck up donnie <laughs> donnie donnie um and they're just like uh, complaining about the drama the dude comes over to the bar and then it just kind of like the camera like dollies over to to sam elliott and yeah. he's just like sitting at magically the bar in a cowboy hat magically so, there i love it yeah you you get because of that like that movement of the camera it kind of like spiritually signifies that like sam elliott is slightly to the left of reality here and he is like watching this scene with us and yeah. now we're kind of like switching to him like do these characters see him i don't know the dude kind of interacts with him uh, at one point and that's fun um but it it's it's cool how you can like s slightly switch up your filming style mm -hmm. to indicate like different layers of reality here yeah it's it's so detached um, mm -hmm. but I think it is, it obviously the movie could work without, uh, or quote unquote work without Sam Elliott's input as a character. He could just mm -hmm. be the narrator. Right. But in putting him in there, he's kind of like, uh, uh, like, like a is God this guy figure. thousands of years old? Like, what's yeah, like he's here? always been there. He's always watching. Um, but he's just like, just like, a, like you said, a weird kind of Greek chorus kind of thing. And then he <laughs> breaks the fourth wall at the, at the very end. Yeah. And it's and it's so good. And it's just like, oh, yes, of course, he was talking to us the whole time. And he was partaking in the events with us. So yeah. And is the, he God? Is Sam Elliott God? Because that's cool. Where you get a lot more of stuff like that is in Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? Which I think is there the Coen's next movie or maybe like a couple after. I, I don't I don't know if there's anything between this and Oh, Brother. Um, I, I think they're in the same like within you know a, a few years it's like of each other. it's like 2001 or 2000 or something um yeah. and so interestingly enough joe i've never seen oh brother <gasps> where art thou fuck justin uh okay well we might just have to watch that, that one changes everything <laughs> that is such a fun movie but like everything stylistically in that movie is kind of ramped up to a 10 mm -hmm. and so it's it takes place during the Great Depression. It, it's about George Clooney, John Torturo, so Jesus from this movie, and Tim Blake Nelson are like runaway convicts um, in like the deep south of the Great Depression. But it's like a comedy, and so it's got that Coen brother like shenanigans to it. But it's actually it is based. It's an off allegory of, off of uh, Homer's Odyssey, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's like one to one with the Odyssey and it's Amazing. so cool, like how well the Deep South matches to like ancient Greece in mm -hmm. that way. Like there's like a there's a Cyclops character. There's like the the sirens that they run into. It's it's very cool. And the music is incredible. The 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 soundtrack for the movie actually won like album of the year at the Grammy Awards. Like it was that much of a hit. Amazing. But from a cinematography perspective like deacons does like some insane stuff with like sepia in that movie and so everything looks like you're looking at like an old photograph That's um cool. it's it is very cool you should yeah you should we'll have to we'll circle back and we'll do a cohen's deacons uh <laughs> combo thing and we'll do oh brother where art thou and i we mentioned this before uh inside lewin davis is one you haven't seen which but i haven't I have, seen but which I also have. is like a crazy looking movie yeah but it's and it also has John Goodman in it as well. Um, so that could be interesting to to, to come back to. Um, God, Goodman's so great. He's so good. I mean, give that guy you know the the shrift he needs. Um, 
couple other things on on like the the cult status of this movie. You know, uh, uh, a thing about it is this movie gains more from frequent rewatches. Mm-hmm. This movie is so easily rewatchable. It's something you can just throw on. You know, if you're working with a group of with a good group of guys and you just throw it in the background and it's on and it's just <laughs> fun. Um, the dude is such like a charming character. He, you're, he's an underdog through and through. And, um, but like his demeanor and his outlook on life is something that's like, honestly, kind of, you know, uh, um, admirable, right. Of like, uh, uh, I'm, I need to get what's, what's due to me. He's, he's, he fights for justice and for things that are right. And, but like, he doesn't, he doesn't sweat the, the, the small stuff. I don't know. He's the dude is, he's the dude. Yeah. I mean, he, he seems like the, 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 the mascot for some movement. Yes. Like he, uh, he is very much like the, the, the spirit of uh, a certain vibe uh, that people want to have. Um, yeah. And it's something I, 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 you know, uh, I, I think is great. I think is fun. Um, <laughs> you know, don't take life too seriously, but like when someone tries to fuck you over, you know, you, you get what's, what's due and what's owed to you. Um, you know, going back and kind of looking at the performances overall of the movie, Jeff Bridges is captivating, cool, effortlessly cool. Yeah. hilarious a loser but a cool loser you know yeah. like i wonder got... how much of like a breakaway this was for him uh is like if he was doing mainly like dramatic stuff at the time uh, i don't have a lot of bridges connections i don't i don't either uh i know he did you know several years after this he did tron legacy you know yeah, yeah. but um i mean he yeah. was in the original tron too right oh yeah absolutely um i know that he had some hesitation uh, i read that he had some trepidation with wanting to do this role because of like a stoner kind of thing, like glorifying smoking weed or whatever, because like he had a teenage daughter at the time and he wanted to make a good example, but she's like, he's so good at it though. Yeah. It's like, dad, you're an actor. Like it's fine. And he's like, all right, cool. (laughs) Um, fucking did it. Uh, John Goodman, like we already talked about is, I think is the all-star of the movie for sure. Carries it through and through. Um, Steve Buscemi is hilarious as just comedic relief of just always being, not one step behind, but like 15 step behinds of any conversation he's in <laughs> a, a perfect background fringe character. Uh, and when he dies, it's like, it's very out of left field. You don't expect that to happen No, <laughs> from a heart attack. You know, it's, it's such a, a Cohen left, left, uh, you know, something from left field that you don't expect. Like, Oh, he died. Oh, but of a heart attack. Weird. Um, John Turturro's Jesus is insane. <laughs> but so fucking funny. The outfit he wears is incredible. God. Him licking that bowling ball is great. Um, uh, let's see one, one other little fun fact here. The, um, when uh, Quintana is his character's name, uh, Jesus Quintana is introduced. There's the, the Spanish version of the Eagles hotel, California being played, yeah. which is amazing. <laughs> but like 30 minutes later in the movie, the dude is in the cab when he's trying to come home from um uh he's coming home from somewhere i can't remember he's in the cab probably like and, the porn producer yeah yeah, yeah 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 and he tells the cab driver's like dude change it like i fucking hate the eagle <laughs> and that's such a fun connection that i never really noticed before which is great um uh let's see oh and, and julianne moore is giving and, and this is a thing i know you'll appreciate she's giving like prototype moira rose in a sense I I can absolutely see it. Julianne Moore loves uh, an accent. I I loved the Julianne Moore episodes uh, in this, and I I wanted more. Like if you watch yeah. um if you watch Oh Brother Where Art Thou, like there's there's also a situation where it's kind of like oh one main side female character, but it's Holly Hunter, mm. and she's giving kind of like a similar like heightened comedic performance. Um, and so you, you see kind of like three lines with Cohen movies. Um, Julian Moore in this movie uh, had one of the, the, I don't know. It, it, it kind of like ramps it up uh, in a way because you think it's like a, a, a typical caper movie. And then she comes in and literally like her men just like knock him out out of nowhere, cut to dream sequence um, and then <laughs> she brings just an entire dimension to this 
film, this story that's ultimately about nothing. But uh, she's she's a very interesting complication here. And she's just like very fun to look at and listen to. She's doing an insane accent, like you were saying, yeah. Moira Rose. Um, her scene with David Thewlis, by the way. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> so funny in terms of like, again, like it it just there's such a vibe in this film of like these people need like some real stuff to do. They're all kind of just like bored and like fucking around and just finding stuff to like fill the time. Yeah. Even if it's like on a rich person, like high level, like let's fuck with the plebeians versus like, <laughs> let's just, let's go just bowling. talk, <laughs> talk at a bowling alley. Right. Yeah. And so Julianne Moore comes in and she's like this like art collector who also wants to use Lebowski, but maybe establish a remote romantic connection with Lebowski. Her dad is big Lebowski. She's bringing in more information. She's kind of like playing a bit on the femme fatale because she looks slightly insane. She's got this insane Bob haircut. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's... Their conversation goes from like, uh, like, 50s femme fatale to like her on the phone speaking Spanish and like immediately going into this like crazy heightened performance with her and Thulis. <laughs> yeah, on um, the phone. Let's go good. I I did love that. Um, I don't know. You you. I guess you're kind of like seeing <laughs> these characters from Lebowski's perspective and how weird and just like arch they all are. Like um, yeah. from Philip Seymour Hoffman, who I. I love how Philip Seymour Hoffman, who plays like the the assistant of the the big Lebowski, kind of like is is down with the dude and like he calls him dude the, the whole dude, time. Yeah, they're, I know. I they're love kind it. of friends toward the end of it, <laughs> even though yeah. he's like a little bit of like a lame cut guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, uh, I I love his performance so much. Everybody like really leans into the wacky. Um, because this movie is so wacky, like every, uh, like I couldn't imagine being on set or reading the the script even of just be like, so what is this movie's about? So what is my character? I'm yeah. an art collector and I'm connected to the main character. This one. What is okay? And I'm ultimately trying to get pregnant with this guy because why? And and it's that's such a another left field thing that you don't do not expect. Mm -hmm. Like they sleep together and she's just like, yeah, I want a child, but I don't want you to be around. Like she's she's in a whole other movie. She um, is. She's everyone is playing their own movie, and it is great. Um, uh, where I, I just where, heard the chink the the little jingle. Um, oh, you want to do a little cocktail moment? Let's do this. I can only imagine and really hope that we're doing that. We did the same thing. I think we did the exact same. Thing. We did the exact same thing. You have to. I I thought I was gonna like church it up and do something different and be like a little clever with it. Maybe I was, was going to do like a, with mine. Maybe I was going to do like a coffee foam or like a, a riff on vodka or swap out vodka. But no, I just went straight middle of the road and measured with my heart and did just like a straight up white Russian, two parts vodka, one part Kahlua, and a splash of cream or whatever you have, whatever you can find, honestly, because that's mm -hmm. what the dude does. And yeah. um, a white Russian fucking rules. <laughs> it's so just good. The way that he can immediately find a, a glass cup and a Kahlua in any given room and just like make that drink while the action is happening to the point where you don't even notice it. He's yeah. always just like has a white Russian in his hands. Mm -hmm. um, incredible. I, of course, also did a white Russian. But let me talk to you about the way I went about this. So Hit me with I'm it. calling this a Kahlua car bomb uh, because a running motif throughout the movie is the dude's car. Uh getting just like progressively worse more and more <laughs> yeah. um, until it ends up completely on fire. Um, so what this is, is uh, five parts vodka, three parts Kahlua. Check me on those uh, proportions there. Um, <laughs> five, five parts. It's been a long weekend. You couldn't, um, he couldn't like further reduce the fraction. <laughs> <laughs> no no uh two parts cream but i'm dropping the cream in in like a, a shot glass uh okay. so that's where the car bomb comes in and then top it up with ice and stir is that is that a uh what's on the side there is that a uh a fig what is that um i is that, a date? Is that a, a, a minjul date a j a I, date <laughs> i was walking on the atlanta belt line today and i bought several packets of Samoa Girl Scout cookies from a troop and uh it just seemed like a good garnish here. So it really is. Support your local Girl Scouts. Yeah uh, folks. 
Uh, yeah, they were nice. Incredible. That's a good cookie to go with this one. A Samoa is 100% the right cookie for mm-hmm. this beverageino. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> a couple other things, and we can we can start wrapping up here. Um, talk about the soundtrack for a second. Uh, the soundtrack is great. It is, you know, 70s stoner energy. It's like a look straight inside the dude's head or his tape deck mm-hmm. or his house or his little Walkman or whatever. Um, I forgot the name of the term, but there's a, like a, a filmographic term or whatever. Uh, the music that's heard throughout the film as like the soundtrack is also heard in scenes throughout. It's uh, so diegetic, diegetic music is it. like yeah, yeah. in the scene and then non-diegetic is like a soundtrack or a score. Yeah. 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 So this is diegetic in that, in that sense where like the, the song that's playing over the credits, you hear it later in someone's car. Right. Uh-huh. Um, or it's on his Walkman or something like that. Super cool. Love it. Uh, has a great feel to it. Like in the late nineties, early two thousands, there was kind of a, res- of a resurgence musically to kind of go back and appreciate uh, uh, music from, you know, two decades prior uh, to the seventies, a lot of bands came out and started doing that kind of style thing. Um, I think this played a big part in that or was just riding the wave. Um <laughs> Uh, a couple other fun facts here. The character of the dude was inspired by real people that the Coens knew. It's like mm-hmm. an amalgamation of real people. There was a person that they knew who referred to the, himself as the dude. Drank imagine, white Russians exclusively. Yeah. Like, that's such a specific person. You have to, like, honor it in film if you're going to do that. Yeah. You could you could see this type of character popping up in like Hollywood or wherever they do their business. Yeah. Or just like a person you know, you know. Mm. Uh and, and even like really specific things like the the they were, they knew a Vietnam vet, you know, who had a rug in their house that really, you know, tied the room together. Like mm-hmm. uh, so funny. And then uh finding an eighth grader's homework in their imp- impounded vehicle. It's such a fun like thread to pull to be like, I'm gonna write a whole scene with that. Um, the whole eighth grader sequence is so fun. Like they off the wall. <laughs> do we ever figure out if the eighth grader actually stole the money? Like, uh, they never so pulled he, on that thread. I don't think. Yeah, they have the money in a briefcase. There may or may not actually be money in the briefcase. They don't really find out um, because the the Big Lebowski's actually broke this whole time. Yeah, the briefcase gets stolen from his car. They trace it to an eighth grader's home because of his homework. John Goodman does like the scariest little sit down interview with this eighth grader while his mom is just like in the kitchen. Yeah, um, and then there's like a whole sequence where they talk about the show Branded. Like, is that a real show? <laughs> I think it was. I think it. I think it was. But yeah, like the writer of the show is the dude in the iron lung. <laughs> the kid's the... dad, who's in an iron lung, wrote for the show, <laughs> and you can tell that John Goodman is kind of excited because he's a fan of the show. Brandon, <laughs> it's so it's such a choice, and it is. And I'm so glad you brought this up at the top of like this feels, uh, uh, like Seinfeld. This feels like Larry David because it is of just like it's yeah. such nuanced story writing and storytelling and nuanced performance like it just feels like that like it has to um, no i mean seinfeld curb your enthusiasm is such like the comparison here because it just it it feels like we are telling uh a, a, a complicated story that is ultimately about like the little like threads within just like regular day-to-day life um the 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 little annoyances the little stupid shit yeah it's great um uh, one more further thing on the eighth grader larry that that whole scene (laughs) in the uh like the censored on-air version of the movie like when they showed on comedy central or whatever how the the thing that the things that john goodman said his line is this is what happens when you find a stranger in the alps You see what happens, Larry? A stranger in the ass. You see what happens, Larry? You see what happens? I you forgot fucking... he says that like 20 times. At the top of his lungs at night on a like a <laughs> suburban street. Hilarious. God, Goodman's line readings. I just want to look down a list of them. There I, I wrote down like one or two. Like Smokey, this is not nom. This is bowling. There are rules. <laughs> Right before he pulls out a gun. 
And I'm I'm realizing like a lot of my favorite quotes from this movie that I wrote down are John Goodman's. So there's that one. You see what happens, Larry. Yeah. Uh, when they're talking about the nihilists coming into the dude's apartment, he's like, hey, say what you want about the tenets of National Socialism, dude. <laughs> At least it's a fucking ethos. Like, like the, the second they get out of the bowling alley, he's kind of like nice and protective of Donnie. Like when they confront the nihilists who are total side characters here. We don't even have to get into them. But like these these nihilists come and he's like, Donnie, th- they're nihilists. They're cowards. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Yeah. They have like swords. I know. <laughs> uh, that fight is such a good fight. Um, let's see the whole thing about uh, um, uh, John Goodman's character being Jewish, mm-hmm. but like not really because it's his ex-wife that he converted for in the beginning. And the whole thing, like he doesn't roll on Shabbos. Um, fucking hilarious. I love that. Uh, and like you, you already mentioned, and this guy peed on it is such a great like throwaway thing to to pepper into your conversations. Uh, if you ever find yourself in a social setting and you're trying to disengage from one group and in- engage another one, mm-hmm. you kind of skirt along the outsides and you kind of listen, you nod along and you wait for the punchline of someone to kind of say the end of their story. And then you throw in and this guy peed on it. <laughs> Guaranteed laugh. <laughs> you're in. Um, try it today uh, at your next family function. Uh, yeah. Guaranteed for a laugh. Instagram message us how that goes. Um, yes, I want to know. Or do it live. Like th- slide your phone in your pocket and hit live and, and tag us. That'd be great. Uh, a yeah. couple other fun facts here. Um, a lot of the dude's clothes and shoes were actually Jeff Bridges' own clothing, uh, which I hope he dresses like that all the time. That's cool. Uh, even though he is on this bowling league with John Goodman and Steve Buscemi, you never actually see the dude bowl. You never see him throw a ball. Yep. Which is great and, and interesting. Makes sense. Here's a, here's a great connection to 1917. Uh, the final scene is a two and a half minute single take, culminating with that real strike that happens. I did think bowling. of that. Yeah. I was like, how many? Because like that's so intentional that they're kind of like getting a little cocky there. I was like, how many takes did that actually take of Sam Elliott doing his monologue? And then someone has to roll a strike. Like, I don't don't know how many takes it was, but it was a professional bowler. So chances are like minimal shots. Where was 1998 CGI where Cohen was maybe like, "Mm, we'll knock the other pin down and post. Um, I don't don't know. Uh, I I read somewhere that the Cohens, at least in their earlier career, like in the nineties and and early two thousands, weren't big on uh, reshoots. Or, oh, multi- I, or multiple takes. I, just I believe it. Just I, vibes, I, you know? I, I fully believe that this film was, um, like, it, like minimal um, CGI input, very much like in the moment filming. Uh, mm-hmm. Everyone is just vibing out on this set. Absolutely. Yeah. Minimal effort, that kind of thing. And it fits the vibe of the movie, right? One last thing here, and we'll, we'll, we'll jump out to the end games. Um, to, circling back to the Roger Deacons, Sir Roger Deacons of it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the big Deacon energy that we're talking about. Our miniseries um, namesake. <laughs> absolutely. <coughs> King Deke. Um, some of the shots throughout the movie that are iconic, I think, uh, obviously is the fun POV bowling ball yep. shot, the revolving one. Um, the camera was mounted to like a spit. You know, like where you get like chickens dizzy in the rotisserie kind That's of thing. Fun. And someone was manually cranking it as they like advanced the camera down the lane. Like so minimal That's effort. That's so fun. Right. Um, but that's such a cool shot, right? Um, uh, a lot of low tech kind of stuff mentality for the shots. The, uh, the, the tracking shot, like in one of the dream sequences when uh, he's dancing with Julianne Moore dressed with the Viking and the girls with the hats and stuff. And he's going down the lane Mm -hmm. and there's the shot like going between the girl's legs. Like it was just like a metal pole with the camera and some guy was just like pushing it, you know, like uh, uh, Roger Deakins, at least early Roger Deakins was like the king of low tech and low effort of just like, Hey, we'll get the shot somehow. Don't worry about it. I mean, we talked about it with 1917 too. It's like, there's, there's like, definite like more cgi elements in 1917 but there's also the the vibe of like maybe he just grabbed a fucking metal pole on the set and was like let's let's do it with this you know let's figure out how we can like make this camera fit into this position at this time and work around these elements of the scene like let's just like let's let's hammer and nail this you know let's figure it out 
Yeah, like I, I admire that Roger Deakins does not over-engineer or like seemingly sweats the small stuff. In that way, he's like the dude. And he was the perfect cinematographer for this film of just being like, yeah, we'll get the wow. shot, guys. We'll get the shot, you guys. Like, don't even don't even worry about it. Do we just land on like our big thesis for this miniseries? We got a right to access Hollywood right now. Oh, my God. I'm wondering if the SEO on Deacons is going to go up just because of these episodes. and We're going to get a letter, either a fan letter or a fingers crossed. <laughs> and I would accept either either one. Yeah. And we're going to fucking frame it and it's going to be great. Um, uh, a couple other shots. The the tumbleweed opening shot is so is such a choice. Uh, mm -hmm. There, like you think the tumbleweed is Sam Elliott talking? Maybe uh, wouldn't maybe be surprised just, wouldn't if be they surprised, made that choice, right? Uh, and then, like the iconic shot of the dude looking at himself in the Time Magazine mirrored thing is is such a neat, fun yep. little little tasty choice there. Very cool. Um, uh, and last thing here, Joe, guess how many times the word dude is uttered throughout this movie? How many times? 87. <sighs> Close, a little higher. 97. It's 160. I, never mind. I didn't say, I didn't mean to say close. 160 well, times. Might, twice as many. <laughs> twice as many, pretty much. <laughs> uh, they say dude 160 times. Super cool. Um, really fun. Uh, Joe, give me some last thoughts here on, on the big Lebowski. Are you going to watch it again? Do you think you, you'll watch it again? Yeah, it's in the rotation. I really want to watch Oh Brother, Where Art Thou uh, mm. after this. Let me, me, me kind of like make this a Cohen's um, Deacon's thing. I also laughed out loud when uh, they were quoting uh, uh, Lennon and uh, Donnie in the background thinks they're talking about John Lennon the entire time. I am the walrus. Time. And so he's like, keeps on saying, I am the walrus <laughs> until. Um, until Walter explodes on him. Um, so funny. So funny. B.I. Linen. <laughs> yeah. So um, good. Character Walter, so good. Um, just uh, living in this in-between world. Can't get over Nam uh, with yellow shades. Uh, I, I, I love it. It's so um, good. I had a good time. I, I, I honestly, I did not take a lot of notes on this movie because I thought that was like the spirit of the movie. Let's just let it wash over me. And it's and it's such a fun thing, and I'm glad that like you have you now have completed the circle. You've completed the circuit of like, oh, now I get where that came from, or now you have an air of the his duderness. Uh, yeah, folks know. don't realize this is like five or six years in the making of me just like beginning this big Lebowski journey. <laughs> it really is. There's a there's a fun photo, and I need to dig it up. Um, you missed it, I think. You were out of town for this specific Halloween at supply.com where our department did a group costume as characters from the big Lebowski. Who were you? I was the head nihilist. <laughs> I was in head to toe, all black. I had a black hoodie with my hood up and I had like white stripes on my pants and all that kind of stuff. And I have a, this is really weird. I have a stuffed raccoon toy from, that I had from when I was a kid that has like, Oh my God. Got the marmoset, the marmot, yeah, and and I had that, and I was, you know, uh, our friend Matt was Sam Elliott, uh, our friend Carrie was the dude, um, fucking hilarious. God, it it's all coming together for me now. Yeah, it was so much fun. Um, I'm glad you had fun with this movie. It is infinitely rewatchable and and quotable. It and like I said, the the value that you get from this movie, the entertainment value, compounds upon each subsequent rewatch so highly recommend yeah um i think we also just like cannot restate how big uh of fans of deacons we are so fun to talk about yeah right like you look at epics like 1917 where it's just like oh shit yeah like this is a modern work of of art a technical prowess that kind of stuff you know he let his deke hang on that movie big time it was incredible this one is more of a subtle approach Right. It's um, this is more of the gray sweatpants approach of like you appreciate you don't realize you appreciate it until later of just like, oh, shit, that's why that movie feels so comfortable and lived in mm -hmm. or uh, flows seamlessly or it has really neat, unique shots and things like that. God, it, um, it really just comes down to who's behind the camera. Absolutely. Right. Like in the hands of anybody else, it would not be the same. It could not be the same. Um, movies man movies fucking dude you it's, get it. it's what we're here to talk about um so 
we're going to transition here to end game like dude uh uh as as the dude probably would appreciate i did not have uh, uh a song i love or, it to, to do to it, so because we're just going to jump right into the game, and we're going to play this little game I'm calling Joe. Who's the dude? Fuck yeah. Um, <laughs> so Joe... For the... listeners at home, Justin just pulled up a single image of Lebowski with the text, who's the dude? Um, this is going to be great. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're looking at. Um, so what we're doing, Joe... And we're, we're going to throw this up on, on, on Instagram, because I made a fucking slideshow, Joe. Oh my God, it's like work. <laughs> It's like work. Welcome back. You cannot escape. This is hell. Um, <laughs> the whole movie premise stems on mistaken identity or two people with the same name. Mm-hmm. So what I have done, have uh, uh, I've dug through Hollywood. I've dug through uh, fame at large and found people with the same name throughout uh, uh, entertainment history. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you a question. You tell me who I'm talking about. Okay, you, so you get it? wait, so like the answer will be one or the other. So here's, here's do I have to tell you one. like which one or do I just tell you the name? You tell me which one and, and we'll get it from the, from the first question here. Okay. Um, so question one here, we have Michael <laughs> Jordan and Michael B. Jordan. I got you. I got you. Okay. Who of these two men is associated with the infamous meme Fuck them kids. <laughs> I'm going to guess Michael Jordan, basketball guy. You'd be correct, Joe. <laughs> it is Michael Jordan. Uh, it. it was from a, 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 he did not actually say that. It was from a, a, a viral YouTube video uh-huh. where he had a bunch of like inner city kids or something like that. And they're like, if he can't sink three uh, shots in a row, or something like that from the free throw line or from the three point line or whatever. If he can't sink three, everybody in the stadium gets free air Jordans. He sunk three. Nobody went home with Jordans. <laughs> what, so an someone, asshole. <laughs> what an asshole. Someone watched the video and said, I'm going to make a meme and it's just going to say, fuck them kids. <laughs> Hilarious. Michael Jordan. Wow. Fucking legend. Uh, all right. Question two. Uh, we have Jackie Gleason and Jack Gleason. Oh my God. Uh, uh, actors uh, of the sort. Which actor famously gave up acting because they found acting less enjoyable than when they started? Um, I'm going to say Jack Gleason of Game of Thrones because he probably got more hate mail than anyone has ever gotten in the last 20 years. You would be absolutely correct. Jack Gleason quit acting because he's like, you know what? It's just not for me. But we all yeah. know it was because he was a shit uh joffrey from game of thrones and nobody liked him he was an excellent joffrey but no one liked the character (laughs) that's right um question three we have gene simmons and gene simmons we have gene simmons from kiss and gene simmons the actress uh who sought professional help for their alcohol addiction in 1986 this almost feels like a trick question but i'm gonna say gene simmons from kiss Joe, you'd be wrong. Oh, it was a trick question. It was a trick question. Uh, Gene Simmons actually uh, has not partaken in alcohol, drugs, uh, or anything of the sort throughout his career. Good for Gene Simmons. Good for him. You know, he seems Uh, like a good guy. He made a promise to his mom. I Uh, I should not have assumed. uh, Next question. We have Katy Perry and Kate Hudson. uh, Katy Perry born Catherine Hudson. Fun fact. Sure. Um, who of these two is a natural blonde? <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess Kate Hudson of Goldie Hawn, because Goldie Hawn is also blonde. You'd she- be incorrect. Katy Perry is a natural blonde. <laughs> what is what is other Kate Hudson? Uh, brunette. No way. Uh, no 100%. way. 100%. She's a brunette, dude. Send me the sources on that one. I'm sorry. The internet, dude. Just a simple lookup. Uh, next question here. We have David Bowie, or otherwise known as he was born at David Jones, and Davy Jones, the singer from The Monkees. You should have put a third here that's like um, Bill Nye in Fred's <laughs> Indian. I thought about it. That's pretty funny, actually. Um, which famous British musician had a cameo appearance appearance 
on SpongeBob SquarePants. Oh, this this is absolutely David Bowie. I I know this because like he turned down appearances on other shows, but he loved SpongeBob, and so he was on SpongeBob. You said David Bowie. David Bowie. Yeah. You're wrong. Oh, you're, you're going to Jones. hell, Justin. He actually played himself on SpongeBob because it's a fun play on his name of Davy Jones, Davy Jones Locker. Um, fun little I thing. Should have gotten that. You should have gotten um, that. I'm Googling David Bowie Spongebob right now because okay. I am 100 percent <laughs> sure that you can, he we is can on circle SpongeBob. Back. We can circle back to it. Next, Joe, uh, a little fun thing to episode one. It absolutely with the- is. Ah, God damn it. Okay, I'll give you a point there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Keep going, keep going. Oh, hold Shakespeare. On. Hold on. David Bowie <laughs> was in an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Google it. Wow, but he plays one of like the kings of Atlantis or whatever. Amazing egg on my face. You can still get a point there. You've only missed uh, two. You've missed. Hey, two. this is a podcast about us learning about culture, so we all learn a little bit. Amazing. Yeah, I should have. I should look that up. Uh, next, we have Anne Hathaway from Devil Wears Prada, and Anne Hathaway, William Shakespeare's wife. Uh huh. Amazing. Uh. Of these two ladies, who has a connection to Dame Judy Dench? I mean, they could both have a connection. I mean, Anne Hathaway and Judy Dench are both actors. Anne Hathaway and Judy Dench are both British. Like, what? What are we talking about? A connection here? Who's got a? Who's got a stronger connection, Joe? I hate you. <laughs> um, you got to validate it. I guess you got to draw the connection there. Okay. 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 You want me to you want me to validate? Um, nothing springs to mind in terms of like Anne Hathaway, the actress and Judy Dench, the actress. Don't quote me on that one. But like I'm going to say Shakespeare Anne Hathaway has the stronger connection to Judy Dench. That would be correct. Um, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dame Judy Dench portrayed Anne Hathaway in the film from 2018. All is true. Oh, with Kenneth, Kenneth Brennan playing William Shakespeare. Uh, were they little, were they uh, married? Yeah, they were like, married. William Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway married. Wow. Famously married. I don't know. I don't know. Famously. I just looked it up. Next, we have Taylor Lautner and Taylor Lautner. Uh, Taylor Lautner from uh, uh, Twilight fame and his wife. He famously married another person yeah, named it's, Taylor. It's, it's two Taylors. Yeah. A tale of two Taylors. Of these two, who has more Instagram followers, Joe? Justin, what what are we doing here right now? <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> I'm going to say Taylor Lautner of Twilight fame. Uh, you'd be correct. He has 13 million followers, while his wife has 1.3 million. Nothing to sneeze at. It's not bad, girl. Not bad, um, but uh, hilarious. Um, last one here, Joe. <laughs> this is the last one. You've done pretty good so far. You've only missed two. We have Fran- Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the band from the early aughts, Franz Ferdinand. <laughs> I want to know what you had to Google to come up with these uh, images. Questions. Oh, uh, it took some research this morning. Yeah. Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> Joe, of these two, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and Franz Ferdinand, the band, who essentially started World War I? <laughs> <laughs> My answer to that is Franz Ferdinand, and I will not specify further. Um, I'll go with the it's left. Fran- yeah. It's Franz Ferdinand, correct. Yeah, yeah you're yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, his assassination, essentially was the catalyst that started World War I. Tying it back to 1917, full circle. Absolutely. I had to, I had to end it that way with a, with a lob. Um, that was fun. That was uh, Who's the Dude? Uh, a little slide so presentation. I'll throw that on the, uh, the Instagram. That's uh, very fun, about. Justin. Very fun. Um, great. So, uh, Joe, last last thoughts on uh, the dude, his duderness, and uh, the Big Lebowski. No thoughts. I want to take a nap. Great. I know you got to get back to work because uh, the fun don't stop at Joe's <laughs> house on the weekend. No. Nine to five, times. 40 hours. Never heard of it. Good times with Lebowski. I'm glad I am like completing this puzzle piece. I, I, it, 
I, I love the structure of this podcast because it really does let me like fill in the gaps in a lot of these like folks filmographies that I just wouldn't have the energy to do on a normal day. You know, mm-hmm. like I I would want to watch Big Lebowski. Um, I just like I, I I'd rather just like watch a 20 minute episode of Bob's comedy Burgers. TV or something yeah. like that. Bob's Burgers. Um, and so this pushing me to at watch these actual movies um, really is like building my cultural foundation in a way that's all um, that's what this podcast is all about we didn't know it the first year but here we are two years in and like that's what we're that's what we're discovering about ourselves you know uh, yeah. super great um i love this movie it's so fun it's fucking hilarious it's endlessly quotable um uh, another memory that i have from the the work halloween that you missed is our friend matt who portrayed uh, uh sam elliott's character he had mm-hmm. trouble all day with his fake mustache and the spirit gum sticking to his <laughs> upper lip uh, all day. He was messing with his mustache, uh, just trying to drink coffee and all that while he had his cowboy hat and his blue shirt and his uh, Matt, who like vest. famously has a thick mustache. I, I wonder if it was like a mustache on a mustache situation. Either that or it was just like sweaty upper lip. He couldn't he couldn't hang and, and do it. He tried. He shaved it too close to the to the skin and um, sweaty guy. Sweaty guy, famously, yeah. Uh, Matt Hobbs, famous of uh, at Puppy Songs on TikTok, Check them out. Instagram. Check them out. Uh, we're friends. We're friends with cool viral people. You know, we got some clout. No big deal. Yeah. Um, cool. So we're wrapping up this series. We're we're going into April, as mentioned on the last episode. Joe is fucking off for the month of April, and he will not be here for four weeks in a row. I'm um, literally out of the country for a portion of April. <laughs> So Joe won't be around for the next month's miniseries, uh, which we haven't like really narrowed down yet. I think it's going to be just kind of like a free for all, but we're going to try new things. Uh, we're bringing back fan favorite uh, Ryan, uh, my partner, and we're going to do something different this time. We're going to look at different types of media. We're going to look at books this time as it also kind of intersects with movies. We're going to do um, uh, Marley and Me. I'm not ready for it. I don't think my heart is ready for it. I've never seen the movie and I've never read the book. Um, oh God. But Ryan owns the book and you should see this thing. We'll take a picture of it. It is worn. She reads it. She's read it so many times. Um, a lot of times when we would used to like hop on a plane and go, go to Orlando for the, for the weekend or something like that. She, that's her plane uh, read. She could finish it on the, on the ride over. Um, incredible. We're, I'm going to read the book too. Uh, and then we're going to watch the movie and kind of compare, contrast book versus movie, uh, which will be great. And then we'll probably do something else, or maybe we'll pull something from the vault and throw it Ooh. up there uh, to kind of round it out. Or maybe we won't. Maybe we'll just say fuck it, and we'll wait for Joe to get back. Because what I want to do when Joe gets back in May, we're going to further explore the space, right? Let's do a Bob's Burgers episode. I'm very excited for that. And we'll explore what that looks like. Maybe it's two episodes. Maybe we do two Bob's Burgers in the month of May. It's yeah, Bob's I'll, May. I'll probably give you a few to stew on. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so we'll come back to that. So a lot of fun, exciting, different things happening uh, in, in the couple of weeks. I think I've kind of cracked on how we can do music um, and, and talk about that without getting fucking shafted on YouTube and all that. But we'll be all right. No big deal. Anyway, catch us out uh, You know, on all the... Uh, social channels at uncultured universe on instagram tiktok uh and the like and wherever you get your pods casted at check us out there and uh we'll catch you around the block uh the dude abides bye